Today's message is entitled, All in the Family. Taken from Genesis 37, 1 to 11. This is not about Archie and Edith. What are Archie called? Edith, um, dumb, what, dingbat, right? Meathead and little girl. It's not about the bunkers. It's about the other bunkers. And I would like to concentrate on verse 8. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and his words. Oh, my goodness. And I begin. As a young girl in West End Primary School, sitting in class and learning about the family unit, I remember being taught that the family consisted of a father, mother, brother, sister, and if you're fortunate, you have pets. I specifically remember, and I hope some do, remember the reader, Fun with Dick and Jane. You know, see spot run, run spot run. And they were always in the scope of my mind as the perfect family. They always had the perfect ending to the perfect problems. Spot always found the ball. Jane always found the pencil. Dick and Jane never fought, and they always obeyed their parents. And to me, it was like the perfect family. However, within my class of peers, in our innocence, it didn't dawn on me that maybe some of them were not in the traditional family that we were taught. Some came from group homes. Some lived with single parents, mostly their mothers, grandparents, or others. It simply didn't register. Nowadays, to satisfy or better yet to conform to the world, ungodly standard we live in today, we have taken tradition as we instruct to teach our children in schools the inclusion family. You know the inclusion family, the now traditional, non-traditional family. Now within the realm of father, mother, and siblings, this includes that there is nothing traditional about this to begin with. Just add two women, just add two men, and voila, you have an instant family with children, all out of order. Talk about confusion and drama to our little ones coming along. We can also point out in the Bible as our resource for all types of family mess. Family structure full on Satan's missile attack since Genesis 3. Confuse, take out what God instituted and destruct and destroy. Destroy the family unit and we have destruction of mankind. Let's take a look at a few biblical families, shall we? Let's start with the Adams family. The first family of dysfunction. Starting out in the Garden of Eden, when structure was taken out of order with the serpent approaching Eve and not the male. He went ahead, bamboozled her. She went ahead, bamboozled her husband. And then we go ahead and get consequences, get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the perfect place, God's perfect place. Out of order from there, they have children. And all this is in Genesis. The order from there came on with jealousy and murder on the family via her children, Cain and Abel. God favored Abel's sacrifice and condemned a Cain for his. In a jealous rage, Cain killed Abel about what God punished him for. Let that sink in. You get the blame for somebody else's mess and you did nothing to deserve it. God punished him by making him a mark that anyone who saw him could not kill him because that was for God to do. Can you imagine if all the sins that you did and God left an outward mark on you? I wouldn't leave my house. I'd be all marked up. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. We just heard about Abraham and Sarah just a couple of Sundays ago. God promised a son to Sarah and Abraham, but Sarah thought she would help God out by having Abraham sleep with their handmaid Hagar. Abraham impregnated her, and Ishmael, the unpromised son, was born. And that started a whole lot of confusion in the household. No patience to wait on God and 
another seed was planted, which grew into the enemy of God's promised son, Isaac. And the two families of Ishmael and Isaac are at odds even up until today. How about Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah? When the crowd of ungodly people came to his own house to get the male visitors, men and female, to have whatever they wanted to do, and he was going to offer up his daughters. He was going to offer up his virgin daughters. The daughters followed what they needed to do by keeping themselves pure, and he was going to offer them up. How about God's apple of his eye to King David, lusting and acting on his lust with Mary Bathsheba? impregnating her, and then having her faithful husband murdered and marrying David to hide the sin. Sin doesn't hide. It may take, look, it doesn't hide for years sometimes. You, look, you could do something years ago, but trust me, the face of truth will show up on you one day. The prophet Nathan said that he would have a sword come against his household, David's, and it's true. When you read the account of his own family, it was a mess. How about the punishment of head priest Eli and his family because of his good-for-nothing, greedy, sex-craved, priestly sons? And I use that term as loosely as they were. Hophni and Phinehas, as they would take the best portion of the sacrifices for themselves before the sacrifices came out, it was like stealing the tithes and offerings right out of the bucket. And then having illicit sexual encounters right at the door of the temple of God. And these were priests. God dealt with Eli because he didn't deal with his sons. And he also dealt deathly with Eli and the rest of the male children because they didn't live until old age. You don't want to be a male caught in that family. Mm -mm. Talk about drama, drama, and more drama. Right in the old, dusty, but up-to-date word of God. It also speaks about the consequences of the drama if we don't take care of what we need to. We cannot be surprised with what's going on now as it has been going on before the recorded time. It went on in heaven. Now, one more family I have to put up there is Mary and Joseph. A young teenage girl promised to marry Joseph of Nazareth and ends up a pregnant virgin. A pregnant virgin. Albeit she was carrying Jesus, and the impregnation was completely divine, can you imagine what Joseph had to go through? Because this wasn't in a vacuum where it was just those two. This was out where everybody could see. And they knew the law. Thank God for the angel that visited Joseph. Thank God that he obeyed. Drama. Drama. Besides one example in the Bible, they all come from the Old Testament. We have an entire Bible full of it. Drama from the first family of the Bible to our own families. Drama, drama, and more drama. So why do we think that it's brand new? As the saying goes... We can choose our friends, but you can't choose your family. The online dictionary, Merriam-Webster, describes the family as the basic unit in society traditionally consists, this is what it says, traditionally consisting of two parents rearing their children. Also, this is what it says, any various social units differing from but regarded as equivalent to the traditional family. This is what the dictionary describes the family as. A, single parent family. B, spouse and children. A group of individuals living under one roof and usually under one head household. A group of persons of commonly ancestry, a clan, a people or group of peoples regarded as deriving from common stock. A group of people united by certain convictions or a common affiliation, the body of Christ, fellowship, the staff of high officials such as the president. The makeup of the family is vast and varied, 
and can be very complicated to say the least. Now, just for transparency, and we discussed some of this in Sunday school, so I'm gonna high five myself. <laughs> Many of you know, and those who don't, that I am a step parent. Now, I never wanted children, and to be quite honest, I'll just put it like this, I took great pains not to have them. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> but I married a man who had two of them, with two mothers. One of my stepsons lives with me. Now, I can recall some wonderful advice I got from my mom and my sister. One day, my stepson went to bed. Normal. The next day, he woke up, and I didn't know who he was. I, I thought I was going crazy. He was starting to do stuff that I didn't get. And I was getting exasperated because... He was doing things to the left, and I'm trying to make him think, do things to the right. And my husband was asking me, what's wrong? He doesn't see anything different. And I was getting so upset because I didn't understand until I called my mother one day. She says, Jan, let me tell you something. That little boy does not have one blood drop of your DNA. He doesn't have your DNA in him at all. You have in your household my husband and the other woman living under your roof. And you need to sort something out. I spoke to Janice, elder sister Janice, okay. She said to me, remember our DNA and stand on what we were taught. Do not conform to the DNA of other people in your house. And that's what I did. It created friction, it created arguments, but I did not conform, and I still don't. They can decide to do whatever they want, and I will slap down that Valma DNA in a minute. <laughs> oh, it's been done. <laughs> it's been, trust me. Reverend Trott last month spoke about the first family, dysfunctional family filled with hate and murder. Like it or not, our families are in a tempest state ever since. Today's text is another family filled with all types of confusion and drama. We are going to look at the portion of the life of Joseph pre-pit in the following three points. Point number one, Joseph, favoritism. Yeah, he's a guy. Point number two, brothers, bittered. And point number three, father, rebuking. Let's go to the favorite son, Joseph. Point number one. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. Genesis 37, 1 to 4. And Joseph dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the son of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel, name change, loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And it was old, everybody. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him more and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, assuming that there are people who have not heard of Jacob and his family, let's do a little bit of housekeeping, shall we? We're going to go back. Can we all say family drama? Family drama. Big time. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, you know, the covenant made by God with Abraham that he is going to be the father of many nations. Jacob, favored by and with help from his mother Rebekah, tricked his aging and blind father Isaac, Abraham's son, and stole his twin brother Esau's birthright, the family fortune. These brothers were already at odds pre-birth by fighting in their mother's womb as God had said, and their relationship reflected it. Esau was the more aggressive out of the two, or he was quick-tempered and didn't think. 
While Jacob was calculating, he sat back and he observed. He was shrewd. When his brother Esau found out that he had stood in his birthright, he was furious and wanted to kill him. Remember, this is his twin brother. Jacob took off. He took off everybody over 200 miles on foot and ended up living with his uncle Laban. Whew. Uncle Laban was shady and shrewd himself and worked Jacob like a slave. This is where I thought of us. Thank God we're not Jewish. While there, Jacob married not one, but two sisters, his cousins. Can you say messy? One sister, Leah, was the oldest, who her father, if Alfred tried this, I'm telling you, tricked into marrying Jacob. But this was in the context of the culture. The oldest was supposed to get, now, now, transparency. Janice got married first. My two brothers went next. I went 20 years later. I was not trying that union, no, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. no, 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 it, it wouldn't have worked. Jacob worked 14 years for the love of his life, Rachel. I don't know if I would have hung around for store for 14 years, I don't know. I'm being honest, I don't know. But not only did he marry the two sisters, the two sisters also gave him the handmaids. So he had four women, 12 sons between them and a daughter. Can you imagine all that estrogen up in one place? Can you imagine that he was, I can't, I know. And their children competing, because remember, they had children with this one, children with this one, this wasn't happy, children with this one, and Rachel hadn't had children yet, but she did. Exactly, drama, 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 but God worked through it all, because out of all that came Joseph. No drama is too big for God. Romans 8.28, and I put this here just because I just want us to understand that it did work out in the end. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Joseph is revered a titan figure in the Bible, a man who through all the trials and tribulations of his life came out on the other side blessed beyond measure and fulfilled a prophecy of God and the seed of Abraham. Joseph's characteristics were he feared the Lord, hardworking, interpreter of dreams, merciful, compassion, and patient. These characteristics do eventually show up, however, but in verse 2 right now, he is a 17-year-old boy. Joseph's name means God will give. Now, 17 years old, I looked this up, and 17 biblically means overcoming the enemy and complete victory. If our 17-year-old men understood what their age meant, overcoming the enemy and complete victory. He was the second youngest of all the brothers and was the first son of Jacob's first love, Rachel. Rachel was the last woman to get pregnant, and also he was an answer to her prayer. From the text, we see that it's an agricultural family, We also see that the Bible reiterates that Joseph was young. He was called a lad. The Greek meaning for lad is pronounced agori, meaning male person of any age between early boyhood and maturity. A boy, youth, a fellow, a chap. Now, according to Grow by WebMD, the average 17-year-old male has a broken voice, and they get their man voice. That's a sermon topic. Getting your man voice. Hmm. Their hair has started to sprout all over their body. It's a crossover for boys' mentality as they begin to think about future girls. They may get a new at all attitude. 
and yes, they're into dating and they are into sex. And now the website says that they are more aware of their, the blood of Jesus, sexual orientation. And they may start watching how their physical bodies develop, wanting to stay in shape. In other words, they're going through some major hormonal changes. Jacob has 11 boys and picks this one as his favorite of all brothers. He and Rachel's son, the loved wife's son. Now, this was problematic, as you, you can only imagine. And that he also loved Jacob because of his old age. Now, looking it up, he was around, ew, 91. Then Joseph was 91. Uh, Jesus. Whew. And to sweeten the pot, he wasn't the last. Anyway, mind my business. Joseph was a good boy, a virtuous boy. He was of good character. Now, the text goes on and says that he was farming with the sons of Bilhah and Rachel's handmaid, and who were Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, and they were Gad and Asher, and brought his father a bad report. Now, the Bible does not state what they did, but it was evil. And Joseph went to his father, the tempest. The tempest. Now, let's unpack this just a little further. Here we have a 17-year-old boy in his innocence. In this picture, he is with four of his brothers. We can assume that the ill feelings have been going on for a while, but let's look at the makeup. Now, remember, it's not just a static relationship. You have a whole clan of people. Gossip. Backbiting. He said, she said, they said, everybody said now, remember, their mothers were the handmaids of Leah, who was already given to this man. So you had three women given away Sunday school in marriage. Given. They had no choice. Can you imagine how they felt in a loveless union and children being conceived in that union? Loveless conception. Can you imagine the animosity and buildup that they had with these boys about the relationship with their father? Just imagine the talk. He ain't no good. He left before you were born. He has another family and treats that woman and those children better. He's just a sperm donor. What has he done for you lately? The seed of conflict were the words, watered by the mothers. Women have a way with words. Let's not get it twisted. We do have a way with words. I'm sure that Jacob's family structure was the talk of the town. Every time one of those women had a baby, he's at it again. Instead of building up a relationship with his sons, I'm wondering if the relationship was just full of tolerance. He tolerated them, like he tolerated those women. He didn't love them. Do you see the family dynamics? Do you see 2022? <laughs> Bermuda, 2022? We have no idea, again, what the relationship with the brothers was like. It doesn't seem like it was a warm and fuzzy relationship. Like I said, maybe tolerant at best. Remember, the mothers make a difference. I'm convinced. Look at Rebecca. Now back to the text. It does not say that Jacob disciplined the fool boys either. Could he have left them alone? Could he have punished them? Could he have expected this from them? He knew their character. Could the fool have been repeat offenders of evil? We don't know. All we know is that Joseph told on his brothers, and this stoked the hatred level up. However, the very next verse talks about a colorful coat and how Israel made a coat of many colors. And I'll tell you what, it's not in my notes, but thank you, Holy Spirit. While looking up the coat, the, I can't remember his name, the author said that the coat was like a birthright. And it should have gone to the firstborn. 
But do you know what the firstborn did to Jacob? He sullied it. So the author says, instead of giving the birthright to that child, to Leah's son, he gave the birthright to his first child with Rachel. I found that quite interesting. The birthright. Hmm. Now, thinking that in Israel's excitement for Joseph, maybe the punishment was that he gave, the, he gave him the coat. Maybe the punishment to the boys was that he gave him the coat. A slap in the face to all women and the children. Now, let's take a look at the coat a little further. Now, the Greek meaning of coat is pronounced sakaki. It means overlay, overcoat, sweater, and anoint. Now, some texts call it a tunic. So the Greek pronunciation is exempono. Now, the Merriam-Webster dictionary says it is a slip-on garment made with or without sleeves, usually knee-length or longer, belted at the waist and worn under or outer garment by men and women of ancient Greece and Rome. Then it says surcoat, and the synonym for surcoat is great coat, overcoat, top coat, a hip length or longer blouse or jacket, a short overskirt. Number three, a long, usually plain, close fitting jacket with high collar worn, especially as a part of a uniform. And number four, a tunicle. Now, tradition and culture had that the colors of the coat represented superiority. So the more colors, the more superior. The coat had many, many colors. Now, look at the, 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 gee. look at the difference. Now, remember the introduction of Cain was permanently branded and punished by God because of his murder and a curse on him. Well, think about it. The outward colors of the coat were probably a physical prophecy, a blessing on Joseph. The complete opposite of Cain. Israel, not Jacob. Israel presented the prophecy and the anointing on his son. In research, the tunic or coat was long past the knee and had long sleeves. Now let's keep it all in context. It's a big deal, everybody. Usually a working tunic came to the knee, had a rope or tie around it, the waist, and was short to mid-length. Now remember, in the context, these are farmers. Having a long coat just wouldn't cut it. They were looking after animals and growing crops. This wasn't meant for hard labor, yo. Now, what happened was, because Joseph got that coat, it was like he was a boss sitting in his office while his brothers were out laboring in the field. I mean, really. Joseph had this prophecy put on him at 17. Could he handle the weight? Now, I will say this. We see pastor in her gorgeous, absolutely stunning robes, but they're weighty. Don't let this white collar fool you. It's a weight. The jobs that we do in Shekinah, leadership, it's a weight. We cannot take it for granted. Are we ready for this weight? Sometimes God is getting us ready for elevation and he hands out tunics. Are we ready for that responsibility? He can hand them out to children, and he can hand them out to seniors. I think of our father. I'm going to get a little personal, if you don't mind. He was born a sinner like everyone else, but died a child of God. He did a lot of things in his life as a man in his senior years, but became a child of God just in the nick of time. Praise the Lord. He was so on fire for Christ. A completely different man. Mm. In his later years as a Christian, and I kid you not, if you were to walk up to him, praise the Lord, my sister, and just start testifying, he was all in. He didn't worry about what anybody thought. He would testify those he ran with. He would testify and do anything he had to do to let you know that his life has been changed forever. Yeah. 
by the blood of Jesus. He went out, the people who he used to run with, drink with, God only knows what else with. And now, you know what he told them? All to Jesus, I've surrendered. And he surrendered everything. And when he died, Mom and Janice, you know we're going to see him again. That we are going to see him again. He died in glory. God dressed him in a tunic. And the tunic was the blood of Jesus. And it is our goal to be one day heavenly robed that we may go and see him one day. Matthew 6.20 says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. One thing, and I have a question for Israel. Did he forget the divide that this caused him in his personal relationship with his own brother? Was he prudent? I don't, I don't know. Not with that bunch. When you read the account beyond verse 11, you will see the behavior of these 10 sons. You will see the dysfunction evermore. This divide separation between them and Joseph was turned into a plan of deception and murder. Does this sound familiar? We just have an 18-year-old boy that was pulled up on charges for murder. Does it sound familiar? In the passage, we are explicitly told that Joseph was the favorite. Did you think the brothers said in their estimation that Joseph was pampered and spoiled? Did Daddy Jacob dress baby brother Joseph better than they on purpose? When Joseph showed favoritism, it made a drastic difference. Was Jacob outwardly prudent in how he chose, his, how he chose Joseph of his other ten? Yeah, he knew what he was doing. Now, my sister and I can attest, and I'm sure you can, if you have siblings, and we were younger, I remember Janice and I, it's a juicy fruit story, Janice, we have two older brothers, and I kid you not. Here's a whole stick of juicy fruit for your brother. Here's a whole stick of juicy fruit for your brother. And here, they rip it in half and give Janice a half and myself a half. Really? Or here's a dollar for your brother. Here's a dollar for you. And here's 50 cents for Janice. And here's 50 cents for Jennifer. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, they sure did. All out in the open, too, and proud of it. Proud of it. But what a lesson to learn, that I can't hate my brothers just because they receive more. And it says the brothers could not speak peaceably. This was the condition of their heart. Jeremiah, as we know, 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Their hearts were cold, and they spoke to him cruelly, sharp tongue, and maybe even threw in a couple of Hebrew choice words at him. And this was family. Do you ever hear how some parents speak to their children and address their children and wonder why the children would address their teachers in the same way? It always starts at home. Children imitate. Hate stirs up conflict, but love covers all offenses. As much as Jacob loved Joseph the best, look at what this created. And who knows, but I will say this, these are still God's chosen people. We move on to point two, bitter brothers. Do you know bitterness is contagious? Five to eight. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood around about and made omniscience to my sheaf. And our target verse, and his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. No one is more hated than he that speaks the truth. And that comes from Plato. And for all you reggae fans, love and hate. 
can never be friends. Dennis Brown. It can't. Well, why not? The Greek word for bitter is pronounced pikros, and it's an adjective having a sharp, pungent taste or smell, not sweet. Feeling or showing anger, hurt or resentment because of bad experiences or sense of unjust treatment. My goodness, haven't we all had a bitter experience, painful or unpleasant to accept or contemplate? Now I found this posting on the internet just under the description. Imagine in your mind, taking that bitter taste on your tongue and turning it into an emotion. You've got another meaning of bitter, a resentful, angry feeling. And if you turn that bitter flavor into a physical feeling, you've got an adjective that describes a sharp, unpleasant sensation like a cold, bitter wind. Dream, from the Greek word onero, meaning series of thoughts, images, and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. A cherished aspiration, ambition, or ideal. Hate, all this, from those four verses. From the Greek word miso, meaning abominate, detest, loathe, and abhor. Joseph, in his innocence, actually begged, because he did say, I pray you, that they would listen to this dream about sheaves, a bundle of grain stalks laid lengthwise and tied together after reaping, and how his bundles rose up against the others. Now, when I looked up the word reap, it says to cut or gather a crop or harvest. Harvest a crop from a piece of land, and I found this one to be particularly interesting. Receive something especially, something beneficial, as a consequence of one's own or another's actions. Omniscience, a gesture expressing differential respect, such as a bow or curtsy. So he told them straight, you're all curtsy to me. I'll tell you what probably more offended him. He probably told him in the coat. <laughs> he probably told him in the coat of many collars. This was offensive to them. How will they be made humble and bow to this upstart, this mere boy, the favorite. Who does he think he is? <laughs> Did he say that they're now to bow before him as a master, as they are slaves? Favorite ruler? Can you imagine the annoyance? And this was not the first dream that Joseph had told them, as our scripture said, that they hated him even yet the more for his dreams and for his words, that's plural. The envy is not only between the brothers, but remember the mothers. It is no secret that Joseph was a dreamer, and Joseph just went on being Joseph. He kept dreaming, as stated, we don't know what influence Leah, Bilhar, or Zilpha had on their sons, but I'm sure, and I will state, look, I haven't always been a Christian. I would probably tell those boys too, look at your daddy. And I'm being quite honest, as a woman, as a mother of these boys, I, mm -mm, I, I don't know. Maybe I could have. Romans 14, 11, 12 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So when they were going to hear worrying about who they're going to bow to, we're just going to go ahead and bow to God anyway, so that everyone shall give account for himself to God. They weren't about to humble themselves, especially to Joseph. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. We are ordered to be humble. James 4, 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One of the hardest things to do in life is to be humble. How can you find yourself serving someone who scorned you or you scorned? How can you be humble to somebody who has cursed you or you've cursed them? How can we pray for somebody who's done you wrong or you don't know how to ask for mercy because you've done them wrong? How can you serve somebody to be humble when you think that they deserve a big dose of payback? 
It's so hard. It goes against every emotion that we feel. We get so caught up in it that it clouds us. And that's what happened to his brothers. They were so caught up in their hatred that that's all that they can see. Now, I really don't think that they liked each other either. I don't think the brothers really liked each other, but they had one common goal. They didn't like Joseph. Now, remember, not only did each of the boys have each of their mother's DNA, they had Jacob's DNA. They had that true DNA. They had that DNA that took off because he stole his brother's birthright. That's what they had in them as well. They were all mixed up. 1 John 2, 11 says, But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they go because the darkness has blinded them. We are blinded by darkness. The Geneva Bible study puts it like this. The more God shows himself favorably to his own, the more malice of the wicked rages against them. Here is Joseph probably sporting his coat. You're going to bow to me one day. You know, the sheaves are all, oh, no, 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 you're bowing to me. The sleeves are all long, coats down here, the collars are sparkling in the sun, and those boys are just sitting there like, mm. And his brother said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him more. Now, I found this interesting. And to be honest again, this message is like two weeks old because I had a whole other message. But when I read this, the word reign and dominance, I'm like, well, if you reign, don't you dominate? No, you don't. That's not always the case. Now, Genesis 42, 6, due to their blindness, they didn't know that God was giving them insight. These boys didn't know that they were speaking prophecy over their brother. Genesis 42, 6 says, And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he, it was, that sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him <laughs> with their faces to the earth. They spoke prophecy over their own brother and didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue. And then yesterday I was writing this, the Lord was like, yeah, yeah, Jennifer. A person today who thinks they have you, don't know that God's got you today either. And I found this fascinating. How can you reign and not dominate? The reign, the verb, her royal office, rule as a monarch. Noun, the period of rule of a monarch. Now, dominate have power and influence over. The synonyms, control, influence, exercise, control over, be in control of, command, be in command of, be in charge, rule, govern, direct, and be the boss of. So you can rule, and that's just it. Now, if you want an example, we're going to take a look at Queen Jezebel real quick, y'all. She was married to the king, and who reigned him? Then she had a daughter and did the same thing. And I mean, those women were terrible, but they dominated. He could be king all he wants, but I'm going to show him what to do. Satan the same way. God can be God. Satan never said he didn't want God to be God. He wanted to reign and dominate over him. And that's what Satan wants to do. He seeks kills, and destroys. But I tell you what, Satan is going to dominate, and he is going to reign, and it's going to be in hell. And we will have no, rec no, we, sorry, people will have no recourse but to follow it. They don't want to go ahead and give their life over to Christ, no. That is who's going to dominate and reign over them forever. Joseph, you stoke the collective hate and offense. I will say Tempest one more time. Point three, father rebuking. Now, after all this, he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made omniscience to me. And he told it to his father. And to his brethren, and his father rebuked him 
and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and your mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now, if this wasn't enough torture in the last verse, God just threw another dream at Joseph. Now, Joseph was 17, and he didn't use the best judgment. If this were Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, it would have been saying, 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 did I get any likes? Did anybody give me any hearts? Joseph was a dreamer, and his brothers wanted to kill the dreamer. When God gives you a word, I humbly ask, sometimes keep it to yourself. Because what some people do is if God says, oh, I promise you this, people will do this. And he ain't giving it to you yet. What type of God do you serve? I thought your God was a loving God. I thought he was supplying. I thought he was this. He ain't giving it to you yet. It could work at your detriment, so we need to be careful. Now, notice that the two dreams were similar. The first dream, however, specifically said about the brothers. This one brought up the sun, the moon, and the stars. It didn't say anyone. But research has it, and I, I checked several sites, that the sun and the moon were Jacob and Rachel. Now, if you look at it in this text, Joseph had two dreams. He interpreted two dreams in prison. He also interpreted two dreams for Pharaoh. He did them in pairs. Now, yes, pastor, I pay attention. When God speaks twice, something is about to happen. Biblically, the number two conveys the meaning of a union, division, or verification of facts. For example, the union between Christ and his church, the union between a man and a woman in marriage, the animals were led to the ark two by two, male and female, the old and the new covenant, the old and the new testament, law and grace. The second dream, again, does not mention the particular, but mentions the sun and the moon. Now, here we have Jacob, who made a public presentation of a coat, who is now rebuking his son because he's telling his father, you're going to bow down to me. Well, how are you? I'm your father. You don't tell me what to do. You don't tell me that I'm going to be bowing down to you. Who do you think you are? Did this rebuke even matter to his brothers? They were so full of hate, I don't even think they realized it. The Bible does say, though, that Jacob did observe this. He kept it in his heart because years later, he was being saved by that very son that he rebuked before. So we have to be careful when our children come and tell us something that may not sound quite. But if we are teaching them right, it doesn't mean that God's not speaking to them. We have to keep this in mind. We're in a time now where God's going to speak to whomever will listen. And if our children are being taught, by the way, we have Kids for Christ Friday nights. Here's a plug. Come on. Deacon is tired. Be happy to come and pick your children up. No, but in, in all seriousness, we have to. I love the research on this. I really did. It really showed me that you cannot take people for granted. Siblings, family, hate, love. Look at all that mix. <clears throat> now, in my research, there were 60 parallels between Joseph and Jesus. 60. That they have, they have things in common. Now, I picked five pairs. Joseph was a shepherd. You find Genesis 37, 2. Jesus is the good shepherd. John 10, 11. Joseph was beloved by his father. Genesis 37, 3. Jesus is the beloved of his father, Matthew 3, 17. Joseph lived with his father in honor before going down to Egypt, Genesis 37, 2 and 4. 
Jesus lived with his father before coming to earth, John 1, 2. Joseph was hated by his brothers because of Jacob's special love for him and his words, Genesis 37, 4, 5, and 8. Jesus was hated by his brothers, John 15, 25, and Luke 19, 14, because Jesus claimed God as his father, John 15, 18, and he was also hated because of his words, John 7, 7, and 8, 40. Joseph foretold of his future sovereignty, Genesis 37, 7, 12. Jesus did the same. Matthew 26, 64, and John 18, 37. Isn't it an honor to have a parallel like Jesus? Are we there yet? Now, there is a Bible scholar named James Montgomery Boyce, and he so eloquently wrote this about Joseph. He was loved and hated, favored and abused, tempted and trusted, exalted and abashed, but at no point... Let me repeat that. At no point in his 110 years of Joseph's life did he ever take his eyes off God or cease to trust him. Adversity did not harden his character. Prosperity didn't ruin him. And he was the same in private and in public. He was truly a great man. One more observation, ETCN, that as wicked as these brothers were, that there are 12 tribes of Jacob on the pearly gates of heaven. These hateful boys, God has a plan. These 12 tribes will also have 12,000, 144,000 Jewish evangelists on earth during the tribulation period, winning souls for Christ. These hateful boys, God has a plan. These men are a part of the ultimate godly agenda which shows me that no matter where you come from, who you were born to, or what your family may have all gone through, and how messy your family is, that God is bigger than all of it. The enemy would like to have our families in a state of divide and conquer without the father around and mothers and children are left to fend for themselves. By all accounts, Jacob should have known better. But look at today, we have fathers and sons who would walk across the street without batting an eye to each other. But as stated, out of all this confusion came Joseph out of this messed up family. And out of this messed up family came Jesus himself. Our children can be saved. Our families healed in the name of Jesus. As Christians, we are not a part of a loveless conception. But... John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved, our messed up families. So in conclusion, with all the family structure being watered down by society, be mindful that no matter what, as children of God, we are all in his family. Let's claim it today. Let's claim our families for Christ. Blessings abound.